Well, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to uh, present to you today. Um, I'm at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And uh, so again, situational awareness and teamwork is a little bit of a nebulous uh, topic. It's something that is very well understood in the military and the airline, uh, you know, aerospace industry. And I'm gonna sort of talk a little bit more about how that pertains to um, everything that we do as surgeons throughout the day. So the definition of situational awareness, this is taken from uh, the US Coast Guard. Uh, situational awareness is the ability to identify process and comprehend the critical elements of information about what is happening to the team with regards to the mission. More simply, it's knowing what's going on around you. And um, the mission for all of us obviously um, has different definitions. Uh, some of us may have the mission for that moment is to, to complete the operation and others is to get through a lecture, to get through a meeting. Um, all those things pertain to situational awareness. I'm not sure how well this projects, but uh, you know, situational awareness is quite important. Um, a lot of it has to do with what's going on around you and what's going on uh, in the background. Um, so these are some examples of, of uh, how Google likes to define situational awareness. But um, you get the idea. You know, it, tunnel vision is the enemy of situational awareness, and um, a lot of us are so focused in what we're doing that we miss the big picture. And uh, that can have detrimental effects on the medical students, the residents um, who are trying to, to learn from us. So in the aerospace industry, um, you know, there are a lot of distractions. And um, I, have, I don't know about anyone else in the room, but for a lot of times I get kind of frustrated the way uh, surgery and, and medicine um, sort of has the analog, uh, gets sort of pinned against the aerospace industry because there are so many differences and yet there are so many similarities. But the, the idea of, of a cockpit that is so um, cluttered and, and so many distractions that you can miss the big picture and, and ultimately lead to a crash um, does have some, uh, some truth, in, especially in surgery. So you have all these influences in the aerospace industry. There are information influences, personal influences, environmental influences, and organizational influences, and they all interact with the crew and the way that they're gonna, act, they're gonna react to any type of um, stressor. So how does that, what does that have to do with surgery? Well, for a lot of us who are in some sort of academic role, um, even in private practice, many of us, uh, or many of you will find yourself teaching students, teaching uh, residents, even teaching uh, a new tech or a new nurse in the operating room, how you like to do things. We're all teachers in some way, so you have to find the educational moments um, and you have to take the time to notice when someone's not paying attention or, or sort of fading out of, this, of the conversation. Um, being aware in the, of the battlefield is, is what situational awareness is all about. And, and that battlefield is really the operating room or the trauma bay or the meeting or your office. Uh, whatever it is, um, you have to be aware of what's going on around you. And some of this, as far as trying to teach situational awareness, in some ways is like trying to teach someone how to be funny. Um, it, it's not, some people are just kind of naturals at it and other people um, aren't. Um, so uh, <laughs> some, of the, some of the times situational awareness also can be, again, like I said, meetings, lectures. So going back to the, the airline, you know, the informational influences, again, this is, this is stuff that's coming in. It's the pagers going off in the, uh, while you're trying to do an operation. The environmental influences, uh, again, the nurse in the background, you know, that same nurse who's trying to, to orient a new nurse is just constantly talking and constantly making noise while you're trying to do your operation. Personal influences are just sort of your own personal, the way you, you are and the way you react to these distractions. And then the organizational influences, maybe there's a time restraint, pressure, get the case done, you got four more cases before you get, get to your, your daughter's play. So, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of things going on and all that interacts and, and, it, and affects the way you react. So, what about on rounds? You know, rounds aren't what they used to be. Um, thank God someone on the internet felt that 50 years later, someone was still gonna be worried about HIPAA and so they covered the woman's uh, face. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is not how rounds are like in my, off, in my uh, hospital. First of all, um, I don't think my residents carry stethoscopes anymore. Uh, I'm like the only person who actually listens to bowel sounds. But the, um, you know, it's very difficult. But, but even still, you know, we have a very short amount of time on rounds. We don't have the ability to go and spend 15 minutes 
you know, discussing and, and talking about things, we oftentimes have just a couple of minutes. I actually find that weekends are the best time to do the, do the teaching rounds because, um, you know, I basically just have to come in round and then I get to go home and it allows me to spend a little bit more time with the residents and the, and, and the medical students and allow them to present. Um, I need to get one of these stethoscopes. So I don't know if they, I can't tell if this is a stage picture and it looks like Woody Allen getting listened to here, but um, it has nothing to do with this talk, but I thought that was humorous. Okay, so, um, and you know, this is the obviously, the, you know, the extreme on, on rounds, you know, everyone has a place, everyone is really smart um, and, and the, and the physician is, is, a, is brilliant and he can figure out all the answers. And that's not always that simple. And sometimes the answer is in the room and sometimes it's around us. But uh, if you're not paying attention, if you're not listening to the patient, um, that also is situational awareness. And that has a lot to do with, um, you know, I agree with uh, one of the previous speakers in that you, um, your, your learners are going to be paying attention to everything you do and you need to, to lead by example and teach by example. And so if you don't listen to your patients and they're telling you what the answer is, then uh, that's going to rub off on your, on your students. So we know uh, based on, some, on many years worth of data that you know, teaching is much more efficient when it's active. Um, if you just sit and, and you lecture, um, it's, it, a lot of people start to lose focus. It's not as, um, it's not as good. So, so getting up, moving around, doing rounds, and, and making it interactive is a great way to do it. Um, but, but Socrates was not a pimp. So, so the Socratic method and, and the constant pimping, and, and that can, as a, a little bit of that can be very useful, but overdoing it can obviously be um, very threatening to, to medical students, can be degrading, and they, get, and they, they feel that, um, that they are, you know, oftentimes that's when a, that's when a student will go off and, and literally be in tears after what you thought were just a couple of simple little questions. So um, be aware of, of, of how to read people, see how they're doing, um, push people a little bit, a little bit of push is good, it helps them to go home at night and study a little bit, but, um, but taking them to the point of, of breaking is obviously, um, is obviously not the way you want to do this. And the best teachers notice when a learner is not understanding the question or doesn't know the answer. So, um, you know, get to the point where you've, you've maxed out on their understanding of the situation and then back off a little bit or take it to the next level. So start with a medical student, go to a, a junior resident, go to the senior resident, and, and, and stop at that point. Um, redirect the questions or promptly give the answers, uh, you know, and, and admit when, you, when you've given a bad question. If someone doesn't know, I'm, I'm first to admit that if someone doesn't know the answer to my question, it probably is because I didn't ask it properly, not because they didn't know the answer. So again, I'm, I keep going back to this military idea of, of situational awareness. I mean, you know, the battlefield, here we are in Boston, I thought I'd show some Revolutionary War pictures, uh, but the, uh, you know, the battles are not as straightforward as they used to be. Um, there isn't always an enemy on one side of the line that we can just go after and try to annihilate. Our, our battlefield is much more complicated today. Look at, you know, this is, um, you know, a very complex operation, multiple staff in the room, uh, anesthesia is in the back monitoring, uh, you know, transesophageal echo. I mean, there's so much going on, so much clatter, uh, so much clutter that, um, that you, you just, you have so much trouble. And, and how are you going to find the time to teach and lead by example in this situation? So it, it does take a lot of patience, but um, you have to be careful. You first of all, try to minimize your distractions. So there comes a point where uh, at some point I just have to ask some, one of the other residents who's not scrubbed in to come and pick up the pager. Um, you know, if, if the chief resident is nice enough to let the intern do the case, um, then that's great, but you need to take the intern's pager uh, because I can't sit there have, answering questions about Tylenols and blood pressures for the entire case. It's just not going to work. Shift changes are pretty terrible. Um, all the monitors, the beeping, all that stuff, they all have volume controls. You can control all that. But you need to focus on teaching moments for all levels and all learners. And remember when you were uh, learning how to first drive, you were, you were taught that you need to scan continuously. So, you know, look at the road and then look at the rear view mirror and then look at the side mirrors and you need to do that continuously. And that's really what, that's how you teach situational awareness. You, now when you drive, it's, it's automatic. You know about that. You know you're gonna be constantly looking at the, at the mirrors and, and you don't even realize you're doing it because you're much better drivers now. And, I think if there's one way to learn or teach how to do this, it's to, is that you need to scan. You need, you know, maybe every five minutes you need to ask a question or point out a piece of anatomy for a, for a medical student and then ask the resident what he thinks is going on. All that stuff, if you don't do it, you just get worked up into the operation and you'll, you'll skip it. 
So um, pay attention to the real threats. Uh, the other part of situational awareness in the operating room is, is what's going on behind the drape. Um, I think in, in listening to, to anesthesia's teaching moments over the last decade or so, um, I basically think I could probably pass the anesthesia boards, and I think that's important. I think you need to pay attention to what's going on. First of all, half the time the staff's not in the room, so I need to troubleshoot their problems. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, watch out. I can usually tell when there's a problem with my patient before, uh, before the anesthesia staff knows because you notice the little shuffle under the drape, you know. As soon as you start asking, as soon as the anesthesia resident starts asking if the blood pressure cuff is, if the tubing is kinked, uh, it probably didn't just get kinked at that moment. It probably is because you can't find the blood pressure. So be aware of that, and, and maybe it's something that you're doing. Maybe you need to desupplate the abdomen. And the idea of a sterile cockpit um, is another good example of, of using the aerospace industry to help us out here because, um, you know, on, on final approach, uh, there's no conversation, there's, there's nothing going on, and it's, it's pure focus on the, uh, on the task at hand of getting that plane on the ground. And so if you're, um, if you've got a difficult part of the operation, it may be time to sort of say, I need everyone to be quiet right now, uh, turn off the music, turn down the music, whatever else you need to do to make it happen. And communicate. You know, we're all in this together. We all have a common goal, and, uh, and we need to make sure that we, you know, we lead by example and we teach everyone um, how to do it. I'm, I'm usually the first one in the room and the last one out of the room. Um, I'm not that efficient that way, but I make sure that the patients um, get taken care of, and I, and I sort of trust no one, unfortunately. Uh, we, since this is a minimally invasive uh, uh, you know, conference, we won't get too much into trauma and that type of thing, but, but the trauma surgeons have, it, have this pretty well mapped out. I mean, the, the trauma bay is absolute chaos, and they focus, their, their training and their simulation is basically all about controlling the chaos and putting order into the chaos. And in some ways, in many ways, that's what situational awareness is all about. And so, uh, you know, remember ATLS, they do a very good job of simulating, uh, you know, the injury, simulating everything, and you can do this without even having a real patient. So it's very important, you know, that as now we're getting more into simulation, uh, we need to do some of this ourselves, um, particularly for those of us who think we're done learning. So what about in the day-to-day -day life, meetings? Well, pay attention to subtle, subtle <laughs> clues. So this is not so subtle, but I mean, obviously, if, if you're in a meeting, if you're at work and, and things are going on like this, um, you need to make sure that you um, adjust the way you're talking. If, if um, most signs of disruption and boredom are not blatant, uh, this is a picture I took of our division meeting the other day. So it's, it's, I wish it was that easy, I wish it was that obvious, but you need to notice the subtle little things. When you're giving a talk, and you're up there, you know, going over something, and you've got people um, who you expect to be listening, and they're staring out the window, or they're quickly checking their phone for something, or phantom paging, you name it, or just sort of drifting off, then it's time to sort of change things, change your, change your mode, um, make sure that you get people involved, ask them a question. Um, skilled leaders bring everyone into the conversation. And again, that scanning thing, you know, if there's someone who never speaks up during a conversation, or during a, a, a meeting, then sometimes they need to be called on. Um, because I'm sure they have an opinion about what you're talking about, and you just have to get that out of them. So in conclusion, um, you know, some of the things that you need to do is, 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 again, going back to the military and going back to aerospace is you need to assemble strong teams. If you've got a good group of people around you, um, they're going to watch you, they're going to they're cover your back, and they're going to make sure that, that um, the, the task at hand gets done. Um, assess the understanding of each learner. Make sure that you, um, you can try to push people a little bit, but don't push them to the point of breaking. Train in simulations if possible. Again, re redirect disruptive behavior. Remove the toxic elements. If there are some parts of, the, of your day that are, that are completely disruptive, then you need to get rid of them. Encourage teamwork, and again, and continue to scan. Whoa. Um, so I, uh, to finish up here, I have a, a, a one of my mentors, um, basically had a saying every time we were on, on rounds, he would always ask you uh, what your job was, and, and your job as a resident was to keep the staff out of trouble. And his job, he would always say, was to make you as the resident look good. And if you continue to do that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make everyone happy because it, it really gives away a lot of your responsibilities to the other side. So watch your back. Make sure you, you, you have people who are going to help you out. And uh, 
Brent had shown this book. This is a great book looking at, uh, um, at, at all the things that can go wrong in a teamwork uh, fashion. So thank you very much for your time.